I have to see the shiny new toy. Yes. All right, golf study. The last time we did a golf study, I think it was in 2017. We hired PGA to come in and actually do the golf study, which was mostly to deal with the golf part of it. This time we hired Professor PhD Amy Gregory from UCF came in this time to do it for us. And I mean, her background, she did the same thing for the county not too long ago with three different courses, and they've all turned around. Uh, but this time, instead of just doing the golf course, we did more than just the golf course. We did staffing, we did the restaurant, we did a variety of the whole process of the golf course. So this is this is video, this will give us a little background. I mean, not just background, it'll give us more of a view of the whole process of the golf course itself. And so this, we started this back in October, I think it was, we started off with this. So it's been, it's been going on for a while. And not only did we do staffing, but we also involved the community with surveys and stuff like that. So this, is, this gives us a total background of everything that's going on in the golf course, not just the staffing, but we got input from the community as well. Okay, so Dr. Gregory, we'll take over from here. Thank you. Um, so just a little bit of a background. Larry talked about it a little bit. Um, I am an associate professor at UCF. Um, 15 years in hospitality management, 32 years industry experience. Uh, so not just one that teaches, but one that did. <laughs> um, probably more importantly, the relevance um, comes from a lot of that work that I did with Burgoyne County. Um, in 2019, I was approached by their director of Parks and Rec uh, with my graduate students to do, who were enrolled in a revenue management course, to do an evaluation of, of their three courses. They were looking at repositioning or dispositioning or whatever it might be. So back then, um, we got involved and looked at the utilization, created some customer segmentation for, for them. Um, we did get golfer satisfaction and preferences, and we actually made a recommendation that they dispose of Savannah's what they did, they sent that back to that homeowners association. Um, Habitat and Spessard, we, uh, we looked at benchmark pricing for them and where those courses should be positioned. Uh, Golf Brevard got involved. I sat on the board for Golf Brevard for um, two years, I believe it was. The university changed some rules about what I could do and couldn't do in terms of board representation. So I stepped down from the board, but I still remain a special advisor to the board. So I help them uh, continually with their pricing and then their um, golfer satisfaction. I run their surveys for them annually. Um, and I also provide industry trends and statistics as it's needed for them to do their operations out there. Um, in uh, early 2022, based on the work that I did with Golf Brevard um, and being a golfer out here myself, um, I talk to a couple of different people about opportunities and things that we, that we could do. So um, what I started, well, um, let's just say we started talking in February or March. Um, in July, we, we did a survey. Um, what we were looking to do was get input from residents and visitors. So move from so many people that have the opinion of, I think this is what we should do. I think this is how it should be handled. Let's step away from that and actually get the input from the residents and the visitors. Um, so that was the attempt. It's an exploratory survey where we looked at behavioral intentions and preferences, um, primarily focused on the golf course in the 19th hole, although we did put some um, additional amenities and services in there just because it was opportunistic. Um, we identified county and city resident status because that was important as well as the demographics. And we, did, we got responses from July 12th through 23rd. And if anybody did that survey, it was lengthy intentionally because we believed that we had commitment um, and involvement and interest. So we put everything that we could in there um, to see what we would get. Um, the city provided 8,358 email addresses. Um, a small number of those bounced back or were duplicates by an eligible for an age requirement. I'm not allowed to survey anybody that's a minor um, at the university, so um, we took those out. So our net distribution was just under 8,000 um, that the survey went out to. We had really strong results, a 15% click through. That just means they got the email and they went to the survey. 
15% click through is unheard of. Again, we had people that were interested and invested. Um, it's more typical to get an eight to 10%, unless you're a company like USAA or somebody like that that has um, uh, good affinity. We had an 89% completion rate. Again, that was crazy good wow. because it was a very lengthy survey. Um, overall, 12% response rate. What we hope for in a survey like this is 3%. Um, so again, we got a good response rate. Uh, 1,230 responses, 927 were complete, 164 partial, and 139 came from an anonymous link. So what we did was we emailed those 8,000 people, but then we also posted the survey to be available um, in case we were missing somebody in the CBNN, um, they could go. So that's where those anonymous links come from. Potential miss on this one because we did it in the summertime. Um, but we knew that when we did it, again, we were looking for directions. So let's talk about first who we got. Um, primarily residents and property owners. So you can see the breakdown there, 74%. Year-round, 18% seasonal. Property owners in Brevard County, um, primarily Cocoa Beach. These were people who golf nine or 18 holes riding in a cart regularly in the mornings and the afternoons on both weekends, weekdays and weekends. They eat meals and happy hours out often. They're older, 47% of them are 65, or 65 years or older. Retired, married adults with a relatively high household income and no children at home. Um, and we, we bump that up against who lives here in Cocoa Beach. It's a pretty good representation. Again, this is primarily who we heard from. You'll see the breakdowns as we go through. Uh, so when we asked classify your residents in Brevard County, you can see primarily um, year-round residents. We did get some seasonal residents. And I went in and I looked at, I get really uh, excited and involved with data. So I went in and looked at if we had variances between residents and non-residents and all of those types of things. So um, all of that's available. Um, whether they owned property in Brevard County, you can see primarily um, owning residents in just the 32931. Um, so did they own um, property? These are just the respondents in the 32931. Um, a little bit of that breakdown. In which Brevard uh, County city do you live? So you can see primarily again um, Cocoa Beach, some people up in the Cape, um, fewer in Melbourne, Merritt Island, Satellite Beach. Age breakdown, sorry for the overlap on the numbers there. Um, but you can see if you um, look at the wheel, just like a clock, um, it follows the order at the bottom. So very small, 21 to 24, um, 25 to 34. Our greatest percentages are in that 45 to 54, 55 to 64, um, and up. Occupation quite a bit right here, the big number, 58% retired. Mm. Combined household income, again, a nice little blend there, um, but primarily on the upper end, which is good. Family structure, that large number there, married couple with no children under 21 at home, but we've got representation in other areas as well. This one you cannot see, <laughs> and that's okay. Because what I want you to look at here are where the big numbers are. Um, and just look at digits. So what this is, what I was trying to get to on these questions is um, when do you golf? And pretty much what this shows us is they golf infrequently, but they do it at all different times, which is really good. Um, what we don't want to have is people that only want to play in the morning and they want cheap rates to play in the morning. So, uh, so this slide just for the picture perspective, you can see that they're spread out all over, and that was a good thing. Um, so specific to the golf course um, and the 19th hole, the respondents, so those that responded to the survey, are generally satisfied um, with Cocoa Beach, the golf course, putting the greatest importance on the course condition and the value for price paid, and least <coughs> importance on services and amenities, including the 19th. So that's a little bit of, of bad news. Um, they just want to get out there and golf, primarily. Um, some were interested in a 
paid membership at Cocoa Beach. We floated that out there. Uh, that would include free range balls, discounts, priority tea times, and booking windows. Um, <coughs> the majority of the respondents indicated an interest in concerts, food and beverage tastings, seminars, um, and potentially eating meals out or having happy hours here. So what we were looking at was the facility in its entirety. Is there um, another reason why they would be drawn to come down here? On the golf course specific data, there was a question where I asked them to um, check a box for all of the things that were important to them as a golfer. That was the first question. The next question then was anything that they told me was um, somewhat important, very important, or extremely important. In the next question, I had all of those listed, and the individuals then dragged and dropped those things to, to um, to indicate what was most important to them. So first I had them get to what was important and then drag and drop. So what we see here, the lower numbers are better on that mean. Um, so the overall course condition and value for price paid were the, uh, the primaries at 2.58 and 3.1. So, so again, you, here you won't see something that was ranked number one because this is a compilation of all the respondents' rankings. Um, so what we know is that overall course condition and value for price paid are up in the very top. The next important thing to look at is the standard deviation um, or the variance if you like that number. They're not that much different. But the standard deviation is going to show you how much of a change there is um, in that mean for everybody. So we want a smaller standard deviation. It just means that it, it varies less. Um, so that tight standard deviation makes that overall course condition a really strong number one. Um, and then, as I said, value for price paid. Um, please rate your satisfaction with, this, with the following aspects. So now this is their satisfaction of that same list of things. Um, <clears throat> the highlighted areas, you can see we've got 80% or 77% there at the bottom in the somewhat satisfied to extremely satisfied. Remember again, this is primarily residents because of the time that we did it. Um, but that's really good news that the overall course condition, um, they were happy with 80%, value for price paid and then pace of play. Um, and then down at the bottom, friendliness of the staff, helpfulness of the staff, knowledge and availability of the staff. Again, in the summertime. Things look a little bit different in the winter time, and I'll, I'll get to that briefly. The grayed out area in the middle, the reason that that's grayed out is because, again, there's just a lot of variability. You can see, even if you can't read the specific numbers, you can see that it's just um, pretty evenly distributed, the responses in terms of satisfaction or, or um, dissatisfaction. So it gave us something to start with. Um, in terms of the golf course, um, I wanted to understand some of the, um, of the behaviors. So would they be interested in calling the course to book at tea time? That's the first one listed there. The things that I have highlighted um, are um, the ones that they were very interested in, but they're also um, the things that cause a business problems or cause revenue problems. Um, discounted pricing, um, prepaying for discounts, that um, uh, paying in advance so that you get a discount, priority tea times, um, things like that, can be problematic for a business. Not that they can't be, um, not that they can't be overcome. I also wanted to know: were there other things that we could do with the golf course, and would people be interested in that? Foot golf, um, smash golf, where you do it with a tennis racket. Instruction. Um, Afternoon socials, competitive league play, things like that. Um, if you see the gray box, there's an awful lot of no's um, in there. <laughs> um, <laughs> so really not much more than just traditional golf. Now, um, all these activities that happen at um, Cocoa Beach Country Club, um, would you be interested in doing these things? Um, so again, we're looking for the big numbers just to make it easy here. Um, this was one, again, where people 
indicated the things that they would do, and then I asked a second question, would you be willing to, would you do those at Cocoa Beach, which is why you see variation in the um, total numbers on the right-hand side. So where the numbers are larger in that total column, more people have selected that as something that they would do. Then this is the response to the next question, um, would you do that at Cocoa Beach Country Club? Unfortunately, there's not a whole lot in those big numbers that shows up in the, yes, I would. Um, so that, again, was a little bit problematic in terms of what we could do. Um, here's the, would you be interested in purchasing a, a membership? Um, so what we see is about 18% of the respondents, um, slightly higher number if we just look at the residents, um, interest in, in purchasing a membership, so that um, could be a possible opportunity. Um, how valuable would the following features and benefits be to you as a member of Cocoa Beach? So here's where the rubber meets the road. Um, the majority of the responses fall in that somewhat valuable or not at all valuable. The things that they're um, interested in, if you look at the very last one, or both of those that are highlighted, free range balls and reduced golf rounds, that hurts revenue. Um, so. <laughs> It's a consistent trend. Um, so the initial recommendations, um, after the data came in, we sat down and looked at um, what we want to do or where my recommendations should actually go. So one of the first things was to identify or agree upon the city's objectives and priorities with the golf course. Uh, so it is an amenity, um, and I was, instructed that it's an amenity um, and a service for the, the community and the residents and the taxpayers. Um, it's also a benefit to local businesses, um, but there's a business side as well. Um, so we can leverage or you do leverage uh, revenue generation that comes out of the golf course, um, and also um, there are common and shared expenses um, that fall in there too. So the next thing, after we had the information, pretty much the summary of all of that is that people spoke and they told us they're generally pretty happy. Um, they want some free stuff. Um, <laughs> so the next step was to look at benchmark pricing. How did Cocoa Beach fit in with the rest of the courses? Um, the course here already does call arounds or you know, looks at where everybody else's rates um, our, our, um, the published rates in order to position um, ourselves. The issue was that there was more opportunity than I believed the golf course staff understood at the time. So they were putting us down in a lower level of courses in the area, and I believe that we have an opportunity to bump that up. Um, so I'll get into that in a second. The next thing was to develop um, <coughs> key performance indicators and a feedback monitoring, monitoring plan uh, going forward so that um, we, can, um, we can continue to hear what's going on and as we make some adjustments, make sure that we're on the right track. So first, the benchmark pricing. Um, <clears throat> so we had that favorable feedback on value for price paid. There was also a perceived low rate um, within the responses to the survey. Um, given the fact that it's a local amenity with loyal and frequent golfers, there's a desire to retain <coughs> low price rounds for residents, um, and residents defined as um, the obvious residents, but also property and business owners. Um, <coughs> so um, I brought to the attention of the group that it's also a destination course for tourists and visitors. There are a lot of people that come to Cocoa Beach for Cocoa Beach um, and everything that it has to offer. Our courses here are unique, um, and I wanted us to, um, to be able to see it that way. So the proximity, the setting, the full service, um, the fact that we've got three courses here, all of the practice facilities, the um, food and beverage, the shop, all of that, um, I believe that if we priced it competitively, it would remain attractive to the tourists and the seasonal visitors, um, and that we could bump our pricing somewhat. So from a pricing perspective, data supports that Duran um, is the price leader, and Duran knows that. They are constantly pushing their rates to see where they can go. 
they're, um, they're very contemporary in that they do dynamic pricing. So they've established exactly what they want um, or what they can achieve in their revenue on any given day. They push the rates as high as they can. As supply goes down, meaning there are fewer tea times available, they dynamically go in and adjust their rates up, which is fantastic. Um, we don't do that, that's okay, most courses don't. Um, they're the only one in the area that does that, to my knowledge. Um, there are um, distinct course levels within the area. So Duran's up at the top. Baytree, Habitat, Spessard, and Vieira East um, are probably that next level down. Um, so not quite what you get at Duran or happy to sit right below the price leader. And then there's uh, Crane Creek and, and Turtle Creek and that's where Cocoa Beach used to be positioned. They're um, county courses, not in great conditions, not in great locations. Um, Cocoa Beach is priced at the midpoint and there are opportunities. Um, so the 27 holes in one location, nine to 18 hole tee times all day. Duran doesn't offer um, nine hole pricing throughout the entire day. They also don't allow you to walk um, at certain times during the year <coughs> at all, regardless of what time of day it is, um, where we allow walking year round. Um, we have consistent pricing Sunday through Saturday, um, and that we, we have an opportunity based on the market to have weekday pricing and weekend pricing. Um, we could have special condition pricing um, as we need it. There's an opportunity for loyalty pricing because <coughs> our, our residents like to play here. Um, and then from the survey, we saw that there's some seasonal programming that we could take advantage of too. So the recommendations for golf pricing um, and the strategy that we should follow <coughs> would be one single published rate. Um, if you go to the golf course, or before when you would come to the golf course, um, you could get a variety of different rates based on a variety of different factors. I won't go into too much detail. Um, but it was a little bit confusing about what you were gonna pay. Um, and what you paid one day might have been different from what you paid the very next day um, without really understanding why. Um, so the thought process is let's go to a single published rate um, that's 70 to 80% off the market leader. So we're not Duran. Um, but we can price ourselves at 80% of the round. Um, <clears throat> we would be comparable then doing that to Bay Tree, Spessard Habitat, and Vieira East's pricing. Um, what we would build is a loyalty and local discount narrative. So we're a destination course. Um, here's our rate. It's competitive with the other comparable courses in the area, but we're elevating ourselves up because we are a destination course. Um, and then we build loyalty, um, people that golf here regularly, or people that do want to do what's um, today the prepaid certificate. You can purchase in advance and you'll get the lowest published price on any given day. But again, it's back to the lowest uh, published or lowest qualifying rate. Um, so um, then we would have Another discount category for local residents, businesses, and property owners, which would be 25% off that published rate, which is actually a nice discount. It sounds meaningful to people. They feel like they're getting a value. Um, offer a Florida resident discount, 10% for people that are Florida residents. That's really just a local thing. People expect it. You know, if I go to the theme park and I show my Florida ID, I get a little bit of a discount. Um, and again, because we're a destination location, it makes sense to do that. Um, add weekend pricing year-round, so throw in a premium for playing on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday when people come to play. Locals will play pretty much any time. They'll find the open spots. Um, that's what they told us. Um, twilight and unlimited walking prices would be consistent year-round. Um, where that one comes from is our walking prices were insanely low. Um, and when you look at the other courses in the area, we had an opportunity to, to bump that up. But we came to the realization that $2 a hole is, makes sense. Like, you know, to, to pay a dollar a hole seemed really low. Um, and again, the residents were saying that, um, that 
the, um, the price would make sense. So that, that number varied throughout the year, um, and it dipped down pretty low at, at certain times. Um, so the idea was just to have one consistent um, rate year-round. Limited uh, fill pricing as needed, so where we see that we've got slow um, or off-peak periods, we can run specials or you know encourage people to, to play at those times as needed. Um, and then we would um, also incorporate some bundling. So we would have, uh, you could come out and play 27 holes and have lunch before you go and maybe appetizer when you come back. Um, it would all be included. Um, or you could come out and you could um, bundle your, your range balls and your round and lunch after or breakfast before or whatever you wanted to do. Again, just to, um, to build some more revenue. Um, okay, then the next was the KPI and feedback monitoring and this is where we are now. So, um, so we, in summary, got the information from the residents about, residents and visitors, about what's important to them. Did the benchmark pricing so that we can position ourselves directly. Uh, or correctly, and now we're looking at the um, continuous survey component. So this just started um, in December, January. Um, January, I think it was. Like January, yeah. We yeah. talked about it in December, but I think it started. Yeah, January. yeah. Started putting it out there in January. Um, so now what these flyers are all over um, the building here. They're on the on the course. Um, they come out. Um, in the CBNN, I believe, at times. Um, but really what we want now is just that constant feedback of how are we doing. So we've got four or five questions in there that hit on the key things. Um, what, we're, what I'm building is an overall net promoter score. So that comes off of one question. Um, how likely are you to refer this to somebody else that you know? Um, and then we ask them about value for price paid. How are we doing there? Um, how are we doing with our product quality? How are we doing with our, our services? And was there anything that stood out to you um, in particular, positively or negatively today? So this has just started, so I don't have the data. Um, we don't have sufficient data at this point for me to show you what's going on. The good news is that people are filling it out. Um, but once we aggregate enough data, I'd be able to give you some directional information on where we are there. So for those of you that are here, if you're not scanning and doing that survey, you should be. That's the only way, that's the only way that, well, it's one of the ways that the city's gonna know. Um, so <clears throat> as I mentioned, um, that net promoter or touch point score measures the achievement of the overall customer expectations. So we have overall score for specific areas the golf course, the 19th hole, and the banquet and the meeting space. So anytime somebody used the services here, ideally they would give us some feedback. Overall experience, product quality, value of the employees. Um, we have the abil ability to segment the respondents and I can tell you um, even from early January to now, I can see a shift in some of the data that's coming in based on more snowbirds um, in town. Uh, they feel a little bit differently than our residents do. Um, but what it allows us to do is see the areas that um, we need to focus on or where we need to improve. That's it. Questions? Yes. Um, I see you had the QR code there. Um, do you have like a spot on the course, whatever, that has a QR code where people can can while they're there do it? It's in the all the golf carts. Okay, and then also a lot of older people don't understand QR codes, so it, do you have maybe in the clubhouse a, a computer set up with a thing that says how are we doing where they could fill out a survey there? Maybe that would be a good idea. Not at the moment. Okay, I think that'd be good for older people that aren't computer savvy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the same, the same link can go out again. Um, on the website, there are maybe. A lot of different ways to do it. Yeah, more data, the better. Yes. Is there is there a chart of specific pricing? I'm just want to get right to the numbers. Like, <laughs> what are the dollars that of the, these other courses are charging, and how do we stack up? You're saying we're on the lower range. I'm, is there 
I actual. Do, I don't have that with me today, but I do have that. I'd um, love to see I didn't it. include it because as I understand, the pricing hasn't been approved. That, that will be presented to you at the March 16th for consideration and then adopted, but I wanted you to have the opportunity to separate the two of those. But that's part of the fee schedule, so you all have Perfect. to adopt the fee schedule for that. I think that'll be meaningful as we look at it and you know yeah. see where we stack compared to the rest. Yeah. Well, and just from recollection, I can tell you that we're not at 80% currently. Um, in some cases, we were closer to 60%. Uh, so again, closer to the two lower courses in the area versus the moderate courses in the area. Thank you. Very comprehensive, <laughs> holistic overview of this. Um, you want a question? Yeah. Um, sir, you were saying currently it comes out to about a dollar a hole, and you're recommending two dollars a hole. Um, you're saying that's for residents or non-residents? That actually, uh, well, that would be the the price. It wouldn't go lower than that. So residents aren't going to get twenty five percent off of that. So is that what you're asking? I'm just. So you're proposing the residents pay almost double what they're paying now, is what you're suggesting? Um, for those that do, um, but with the other adjustments that are in there, it's not double. It's, it won't end up being double. But again, that's a. It's walking. Okay. Walking. Yeah, this is walking. Walking only and twilight. Uh, twilight rooms. But I honestly, I think that's probably outside of the scope of what I should be talking about today okay. because that all hasn't been approved. Right. And I bypass. I know there's a lot of folks here. The public comments. We'd, we'd love to hear from you. Anybody? I'm not a golfer, so I am out of my lead completely. Uh, Mr. Alexander, uh, anyone? <laughs> well, you're welcome to email us. Um, it, it certainly. You've got a question. Yeah, so, Sorry. what are some of the just the history of the two? You said Spressard, and what was the other one that they had a deep, deep platforming or deep? What, did they go private, or what were some of our oh, details the of their changes? Oh, the county courses? Yeah, but you so said there was yeah, two of them. They, they had the county uh, managed Savannah's, right. Spessor Holland, and um, <coughs> Habitat. And in the work that the graduate students and I did, we, uh, we separated out the three and looked at them all independently. Um, the county deter or decided to disposition Savannah's for a number of different reasons. Um, and then we positioned Habitat and Spessard, much like what I recommended here in the, in the benchmark following, uh, following Durant. Habitat and Spessard's have been extremely profitable um, over the last. Gentleman in the red shirt um, is a, a friend of mine from down there. Um, and he's in charge of those two courses. Um, but we were able to really turn that around with the knowledge that he has in terms of golf, golf course operations and maintenance and um, agronomy and all of the stuff that I don't know. Um, and I helped on the, on the data side. So um, those, those courses have been performing extremely well. When you say disposition, what, what does that mean, babe? Privatize the management side of it, or the county. The county, the county, county actually gave Savannah's back to the homeowners association there, um, and now they manage it. And, and for the city, I'll, I'll kind of give you a little bit of information, and city attorney can definitely stop me and speak. Um, so, in looking at the functions of how the golf course and the properties could <coughs> be managed for other uses, we talked about the marine in the future or whatever that might be. A part of the requirement of our trust. Our, it's the deed. It's the, the deed from the um, trustees of the Internal Improvement Fund of the state states that we really can't outsource this building, this facility, the services here. So we have to manage the services here. The same would apply for a marina or anything else we may choose to do here at the course. There are restrictions on how we would be able to operate and the operation really relies on the city being the operator and not outsource. 
I don't know that we really knew enough of all of that when we started the the process of at least look at putting the survey out where we could have put that in the survey. We've just found that out through all the other processes we've gone through, specifically reading into the deed requirements of the looking at the other properties that we might use here. The, could you explain again uh, how we did the tennis, um, how we sublet the tennis to be to, for that to be profitable? So I, I think if, I, if I'm understanding, so, and again, Lair can speak to it too, but um, those are, um, we're, we still own the course, we're still collecting, so it's not the same as putting all those services out there. So, oh, yeah, yeah. I'll let him explain exactly yeah, yeah, that. Yeah, the, the tennis is actually a different facility compared to this as far as ownership. This was actually the tours. I don't think the tennis court is actually that's part of the city property. Yeah. That's part of the public works property. Yes. Uh -huh. But also it's the type of contract. It's, it's not the same. Yeah. Okay. So that was my question. So I know we had a private operator at the 19th hole. Yes. Is and that? You can have a private operator. It's just you can't, for instance, you can't long-term lease, like do a 99-year lease to somebody to build a marina. Which is you couldn't do a 99-year lease to But you could have a, like a management agreement with some you, private party? You could. I, I believe you could. Let me look at that more closely. But I, it would probably depend upon the terms of the management agreement. But if they're managing it for the city, as opposed to a long-term lease where they're managing it for themselves, and making basically. Money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. And some yeah. sort of revenue think, share or whatever. I think the tennis yeah. is more of that contract that's just a contract, not a long term. I mean, you have an option as a commission every three years yes. to like continue that or not continue that. And it's, and it's not the entire uh, facility, it's lessons or certain pieces of that. So it's very specific, we would need to we definitely still look at that. The facility. Right. They just run the programs. Yeah. Yeah. What was your yeah, that's all I'm looking for is, is yeah. to be able to quantify what that opportunity is, if it makes sense to have a more efficient operation. Obviously, I want to maintain and improve services for, for the customers, but if we can come up with a cleaner way to run it. I mean, I would obviously like to make retain yeah. it ourselves and make ourselves the money rather than pay somebody else to make it, but we, if we can get someone to manage it that understands better or something, if that's, if that's the problem. But know. I think that was also Dr. Gregory's, that was her responsibility to give us those thoughts, whether or not it would make sense for us to, and right. I don't, maybe I missed that in the conversation, whether or well, not we should consider that. Yeah. If, the presentation was focused on the data, sure. but I just asked Laird if he wanted me to opine, and you're exactly right. You you want to retain yeah. the revenue here. Um, having been involved with Golf Brevard since, since it started, um, and still, I've seen some changes and some things happen. There are other organizations out there that can come in and do management for you. The problem, is, in my opinion, what I understand this amenity um, to be for the city and for the residents is inconsistent with what those management companies are gonna want to do with it. Um, so I don't believe that it makes sense. Um, I don't believe that it makes sense to outsource it. I do believe that there's an opportunity maybe to bring in a little bit more expertise. Right. Um, I also believe that we can do a little bit more with, with pricing um, and continue the work that we're doing here to see where is where is the value um, and where can we, for lack of a better term, exploit that. Um, my background is in lodging in Florida. And well, I've been all over, but in Florida, we always said you're going to make your money between December and May when all the visitors are in. And that's the exact same um, approach that I would take here. We shouldn't be doing any special pricing, certainly not for non-residents uh, this time of year. Right. Um, they're they're going to pay at other places, and I believe that we can position ourselves at a price point, and then with this type of survey and feedback information, we can see you know how are we doing. But the course is packed. Um, I mean, in a lot of ways, it's over capacity. Um, the pace is slowing down. There's some things that are that are going on, but there's a lot of opportunity, and I don't, in 
the experience that I've had over the years that I've been doing it, I don't think we're going to get negative pushback and we're going to lose rounds. And, um, but I think that we can keep the benefit and the pricing where we want it to be for the residents as their amenity, um, but those that, that come and visit um, and use it as a, as a play place, that we can price ourselves appropriately. Public comment, and just, uh, yeah, he was first, and then you're, you're next, sorry. Uh, Scott Cunningham, 2100. Um, I just was wondering if you mentioned, Mark, the, like the 19th hole and the, and the shop, and uh, I'll say the auxiliary kind of services, with the others, I mean, are the hours and the pricing and all that also contributing well to you know, trying to make the golf course more profitable? to worry about 
when we look I, at pricing. I look at it and I see where they are. And I'll tell you, as soon as Duran bumps their prices, um, Manatee does it too. Mm, okay. Um, Patrick Air Force Base does it too. Everybody, did, everybody does. Okay. And my second question was, um, for for a place like Duran, and how much they charge, um, how does the value of, I, I'm, I'm not a golfer either, so how does the value of what we have here for golf players compare to Duran? There's a lot more program, well, there's a lot more programming there. They've got um, a much more contemporary facility in terms of their restaurant and food and beverage. Mm. Um, but like we do, they have a captive audience as well um, okay. of all of the homes around there um, and the people that snowbird and, and come in. Um, so they're newer and brighter and shinier. Um, they're also more centrally located, um, which, which pushes demand that way. So with them, it truly is that supply and demand and that's what they're, what, that's what they're working on, which is why they can be that price leader. They'll continue to push their prices, and they're not the people that they're pushing away. They're backfilling with others, and as we're all seeing more and more people move into the area, they're probably reaping those benefits more so than anybody else. That's where all the new growth is. Right. Um, I have a question that probably was not brought up, but maybe we should bring it up. I am a golfer. I golf a lot out here. I love it. I've golfed out here since I was in high school when it was 18 holes. Um, other courses, if you make it tee time, you have to give a credit card, so when you cancel and you, you don't show, then you get charged. We don't do that, even though you know, I know we're, a, uh, you know, we are a city course and et cetera, but everybody's doing it now. And, yeah, and you leave I mean. big holes in your course when you could be filling that in and have more play. Um, so that's one question, is that, would that be considered that, you know, maybe you know, a percentage of it that you have to pay for. Uh, the next thing is that Duran charges as high as they do is because the service they provide also. You know, when you go to Duran, they take your car, your clubs, they put it on a cart for you, and they say, thank you for coming. Mm -hmm. So there are, there are services that they provide that we do not provide. Um, I'm not saying they, you know, I, I'm saying we should up our services. Yeah, I am saying we should up our services. We should be able to do a little bit more for our customers because we are facing, even even your your residents would like a little bit of, of help. You know, here, drop your clubs and yeah, we'll take care of you. So there's that and then, and then there's the, the, the fact that uh, every other course in the county enforces slow play. They enforce don't take your cart places, they enforce et cetera. We don't necessarily enforce it, not possibly because a lot of people come out and never played golf before and they drive their carts all over the place. However, you need to, if you're gonna have accountability for everyone out here, you need to uh, allow them to have the authority to do something. If, if someone comes out here and they wreck a golf cart, they should be banned from coming out here again. They, you know, you know and, and they were careless. That doesn't happen here. You can wreck a cart, eh, you know, so much. You know, the city will fix it. Um, so there, is, there, there should be consequences for um, destroying city property, for having, not being courteous, for not following the etiquette and, and playing golf. So those are just my suggestions there. Thank you. Um, I, I think like every amenity that the city has, um, be it golf, the pool, whatever, I mean, these are all amenities that people live here for a reason. And I think we always have to strive to do better. I mean, status quo is never good enough. We, we just need to do better. And thank you for bringing all these suggestions to heart. And from a fiscal standpoint, we certainly need to lessen the, the cash bleed that it has. I mean, we had a former elected official that wanted to cement in the pool because it was losing money. Well, you know, there are kids here that have gotten full scholarships because if we have an Olympic swimming pool here, you can't put a price on that. For me, it's an amenity that we need to support, uh, just like the golf. I, I don't golf, but I understand the draw. There's an amenity that you have to maintain, and you have to elevate it. You can't, status quo is not good enough anymore. 
I think we need to really look at this. And I'm glad you really did this. Thank you. And Miss, I'm sorry, you had a comment. And then we're almost out of time. Mm -hmm. Be the last one. I also play golf 12 months a year, and I play a lot of it. Um, I believe my experience is here. We're probably about 70% of what Duran provides. I would love to see us step up to that, uh, to be 100% of what Duran, or even Spencer Holland, um, provides for golfers. And maybe the answer is now that we have a lot of information that Amy's group has very thoughtfully and, and thoroughly put together, maybe there should be a task force that now studies this in information and walks around the golf course if they don't pay, play. And if they do play, that's even better because they've experienced already. And see how we can become 95% or 98%. Because I think we have the potential to do that. Mm -hmm. It just is going to take rolling up some sleeves and, and doing some work. Thank you. Tim, last one. Keep this short as possible. Um, Commissioner Willis, you mentioned that you don't golf. No one up there golfs. Commissioner Williams doesn't golf. I suggest you all, I don't think you, you don't golf. I only pontificate. Okay. <laughs> That's a fact. All right. So what I suggest is going out the golf course, take a little tour of our golf course, look at the, the tees, the greens, the fairways, sand traps that are not actually sand traps. They're shells and things in there. And then go to Durant. Go to Spencer Holland, which is... A county course. It's a public-private course. like you'd be a great candidate for that task force. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. Ben, can I just add yeah. one thing on the last couple of people? I think the important thing to take away is that the, the residents, the people that we surveyed in the summertime, they like the value for price paid, um, and, uh, and they're generally happy with what's going on now. The opportunity lies in what we do while the snowbirds and the, and the guests and tourists are all here. That's where the opportunity lies. Right. And right now, we're Wait, price well. lower. So without changing much, uh, we have that opportunity. And I'm not convinced that the, the purpose of the continuous survey is to see how far we can go with the residents and the non-residents. I'm not convinced yet the data doesn't support that we've got a year-round market here that will pay for a course with higher services. Uh, uh, Mayor, just 
just a quick, uh, the, the question was asked, what's, what's the end game? I mean, the end game is that, like you said, we're not, this isn't a draw on the city, but for one, maybe we can have some nets that aren't half hanging off. Maybe we can have some better curb appeal. You know, maybe we could bring this course up to where it makes sense, like you said, to charge these prices. The end game is we can't fix this stuff up because we don't have the money to do it. So we're gonna have to figure out how to do it. We gotta charge more. We gotta make the stuff where it's, it's valuable to be what it is. So that's the end game is to make a nicer place for everybody, not get rich, but not be a draw. And to that point, that's a lot of what we'll bring to you in the future. Again, we've got a lot of suggestions based on Dr. Gregory's um, presentation and in conversation with her. Um, we've got service levels we've got to look at. And again, the course, um, revenue base going forward. Will the, reven will the new revenues cover those changes? So we have a lot of that information we need to bring to you, um, but also some investment into this facility. Um, so that'll be something that you'll see between now and mid-year so that we can move forward with some of those changes. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Our work